say that there are other planets that we need to take into account in the analysis, right? And so it's not really like it's an experiment that can test the theory. It's an experiment that can test the assumptions maybe, but only in the context of the theory, you know? And so the theory isn't ever really tested by the experiment that you run. Um, so the, the goal of this class is going to be to teach you to sort of speak and understand and be fluent with the language of economic, uh, of economic analysis. Um, Rajat, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah, okay. So, um, what plays the role of, you know, something like the principle of gravitation in economic analysis? Um, well, let's think about uh, Dar Darwinian analysis, about evolution, right? The typical argument you get in evolution is basically that every organism evolves to maximize its fitness given its environment, right? So the camouflage is a perfect example of that, right? It, you know, this animal was stuck in this environment where it was facing these predators and these were the rocks and so forth, and so it adapted to camouflage itself against those rocks, right? And pretty much economic analysis runs in very similar types of ways. So economic analysis says that there's these things called utility or preferences, which in biology are basically the fitness of the animal, how much it reproduces. And then there are constraints, which are basically like the niche or environment in which the animal finds itself. And um, the, these preferences are assumed you know, to be basic and not to vary too much across people, just like the necessity for reproduction doesn't vary much across different organisms. And these come not from economics, but from things like psychology, sociology, biology. We as economists don't spend much time analyzing what preferences people have or how they trust people. Instead, we take these as given uh, facts from sort of other fields. And then we interpret all the constraints that people face as prices and markets in which they interact. Um, and then, uh, those constraints are uh, elaborated by things like technology available to people. You know, how can people turn certain things into certain other things? The markets in which they interact and the information available to them. And these are strongly influenced by the laws of natural science. So for example, we'll make an assumption that you know, the cost of producing something is uh, you know, very close to linear if there's an easy way to reproduce it, you know, based on the physical structure. On the other hand, if it requires that, you know, we build a very large factory, if that's the basic uh, engineering of the matter, then we're going to think that there's going to be a fixed cost and then some low marginal cost. And economists tend to fo focus on the behavior not of individual people with one another, but rather on their small role that they play in a large market system. So, I don't think that economics is the only approach to social problems, and I don't even think it's necessarily the best for thinking about all social problems, but I hope that you'll find that it's a useful discipline on your thought, um, that it provides a, use, a, a sort of fruitful framework for thinking about a number of applications, and that it can apply even beyond the standard types of settings that you might think of as economic problems, to think about things like people's, as you'll see in some problem sets, Think about the behavior maybe of street vendors uh, in Latin America or about the behavior of people in terms of uh, they, how they choose their health or how they choose who they marry or a number of other things like that. Okay, so to give you a sense for the range of things that economic analysis can be used for, I want to now quickly go through sort of a laundry list of types of problems which um, are like, you know, real social problems that you'll probably, around campus, uh, at parties, be talking to your friends about, that I hope that as a result of taking this class, you'll be able to give much more coherent, useful, interesting answers to. Um, and in particular, the, this list is going to come from things that will come up in lecture, in your problem sets, and on your exams. So you'll learn how much debt should companies take on, and in what circumstances. 
you learn uh, when it makes sense to have sort of special tax breaks or subsidies for, say, working mothers or the earned income tax credit or giving people benefits if they're unemployed. Um, how uh, social prestige can help correct some market failures and when it does a good job of that and when it doesn't. Um, when should, in an when we design an auction, should everybody be able to win if they fit the highest amount? Or when should some people be favored? They'll have to say uh, they, they could even lose and they would still win. They could even bid less and they could still win. And other people will have to win by uh, some amount, more than just a little bit, in order to win the auction. Um, when should companies uh, give discounts if you buy more of their product? You know, lots of times it's cheaper to buy per unit to buy more. When should companies uh, use a policy like that? How progressive should the tax system be? Should we have some special tax on millionaires like Obama wants, or should we have a flat tax like a lot of Republican candidates want? How generous should unemployment be, the benefits be? How long should they last, and how uh, much benefit should people get? Um, what's the right mix of subsidies for research and development? and intellectual property in incentivizing the development of new green technologies, for example. Um, when does it indicate that something's wrong with an internet company, that it's losing a lot of money to begin with, and claiming it's going to make it up later? Or when is that a good part of your business strategy? Um, when should we approve mergers between different companies? Or when are they likely to be too threatening to competition, and therefore we shouldn't approve them? Uh, when is it necessary to use eminent domain to build a road or a bridge or a, uh, or a research facility? And when should we leave it to the private market? Um, when should we be harsher on monop monopolies that are created by collusion or cartels than on a monopoly that was just created by an individual on their own? Uh, and when is voting a good way to make a decision as a group? Or when should we use some other type of an approach? Um, in order to be able to answer these types of questions, you're going to need to learn to master a, a range of skills that we're going to learn in this class. And so I'm going to, I want to briefly run through um, the sort of uh, particular areas we're going to be covering during the class. So uh, today I gave an introduction. On Thursday we're going to talk about how companies make decisions. Um, what is the legal basis of a corporation? Uh, how do we think of companies as behaving? What should companies try to achieve? And what do they, in fact, try to achieve? Uh, what, are, what are the internal conflicts that occur within companies? Uh, and how are these affected by the financial structure of the company? What things should happen within companies? And what should they subcontract to other companies? Um, we'll think about costs of production. How can we describe these uh, mathematically? Um, how do we graphically represent them? H how do we classify them into fixed and variable sunk costs? What are cost curves and how are they related to one another? Um, and what are standard assumptions that we make about cost curves and how have in practice in the real world people actually measured them? Um, we'll think about how much a firm, an individual firm will supply to the market. Um, if they're competitive, how um, their profits that they make are related to their cost function, how do they respond to short-term changes in the demand for their product, and how does that compare to long-term changes in, their, in the demand for their product. Um, and how are these different types of responses related to one another? Um, and how does it depend on what types of things the firm needs in order to produce its product? Um, we'll then move from an individual firm to an industry as a whole. And we'll think about how the profits that a firm makes relates to what other firms are in the industry. Um, how do we build up the uh, industry supply curve from the individual firm's demand curve, a uh, supply curve, uh, how that is made up both of the entry of new firms into the industry and the expansion of production of existing firms. Um, when do firms, even when they're competitive, make profits? 
what is the role of exceptional talent and ability by the managers in the firm's profits? We'll talk about some of the empirical regularities of the size and profits that firms make. We'll then talk about the equilibrium of markets, about how to represent this graphically, uh, as well as why international trade helps promote efficiency. Um, we'll talk about the social efficiency of the price system and when it's better or worse than other alternatives to the price system. Uh, we'll talk about what's called the payment in accordance with product principle and how we deal with externalities. Um, as well as alternative ways to Bergovian taxation to dealing with externalities such as damages uh, in litigation and things like cap and trade. We'll talk about Coase's theorem, which is another solution to the externality problem, and how information plays a role in externalities. And then we'll explicitly turn to thinking about how do we figure out what externality is caused by any action that someone does, um, both about objective and scientific calculations related to things like global warming, and uh, including the statistical value of human lives and the effects of carbon on uh, people's lives, and then about surveys that can be used to determine how much people value various things, as well as the problems with those and how uh, we can use economics to help overcome those problems. I'll then talk about um, Mono the basics of monopoly theory. Uh, how does a monopoly maximize its profits? What's its optimal price like? And how does that relate to the elasticity of demand? Uh, the dead weight loss created by monopoly. Uh, and we'll look at that both in theory and in the data, empirical measurements of it, as well as how 